Good morning, everybody. Thank you, as always, for joining with us today. Uh, we're just giving it a moment for everybody to join the Zoom this morning. We have a great uh, Grand Rounds talk. Of course, before we get into that, we'll start with some updates. We'll turn over to Dr. Harmon, Associate Chair for Women in Medicine. Thanks. Um, so a brief reminder as we're celebrating Women in Medicine Month, uh, today is our photo. It's today in person at the Clark Center steps at 12 p.m., 12.30 p.m., wear red, white coats, and your masks. <laughs> and then we'll have actually another, a virtual photo, um, kind of in a nod to our hybrid world at 4 p.m. to 4.30 p.m. wear red. Um, I'll have links uh, in the chat for uh, the website where you can download backgrounds, uh, Zoom backgrounds as well for that. Next slide. Another event that I wanted to highlight um, that you've heard me mention previously, Inclusion Rounds is this week. Um, it's tomorrow, Thursday, 12 p.m. to 1 p.m. This will be uh, a special in Inclusion Rounds on the intersectionality and the experience of Black women in medicine. Um, Dr. Tamara Dunn, our Associate Chair for Diversity, will be moderating a panel that will include Dr. Diana Sejas, um, Assistant Professor of Neurology at UNC, uh, Dr. Vanessa Grubbs, um, who is a physician author, um, primary care physician and nephrologist and a California Healthcare Foundation contributing writer, and Dr. Stella Staffo, the New York Academy Med Medicine Fellow and founder of Just Equity for Health. So tune in tomorrow, 12 p.m. to 1 p.m. Um, I'll put the registration links in the chat. Um, not too late to register. Uh, next. I just wanted to um, kind of call your attention to our continued features uh, in um, all of our different kind of networks and social media outlets. Uh, this you'll see some uh, on your on the screen uh, Twitter features, but these are all um, links to articles featuring faculty, staff, uh, and uh, trainees in our department. Uh, and uh, our newsletter this week has uh, featured Cecil Bonini and Karina Delgado. Tarasco um, on uh, recruiting diverse candidates. And so that's the, the takeover for the newsletter um, this week. And with that, um, I will pass this, uh, the announcements on to Dr. Tamara Dunn, who will introduce a Hispanic Heritage Month. Thank you, Dr. Harmon. We have happy Women in Medicine Month, everyone, and also happy Hispanic Heritage Month. There are lots of things going on. Um, Hispanic Heritage Month began September 15th and will go on through the middle of next month. And we have some grand round speakers in the spirit of Inclusion 2021, including next week, Dr. Narjus Duma from Dana-Farber will be with us, followed by our very own Dr. Bonnie Maldonado, who will be giving us some of her wonderful insight on COVID-19 and her work in the FDA. And finally, um, rounding out Hispanic Heritage Month, we have Dr. Vinicio de Jesus Perez from Primary Care and Critical Care Medicine. Um, pulmonary and Critical Care Medicine, thank you. Um, and finally, we will have Dr. Rafael Campo, uh, who will be doing an inclusion rounds at the end of October. Um, he is a poet, he is from Harvard. We will have conversation with him and it will be a wonderful inclusion rounds. So please stay tuned for the exact date. And we're looking forward to seeing you at all of these events. Thank you, Dr. Harmon. And finally, I will pass the baton to Dr. Kevin Schulman to introduce today's speaker. Great. Thank you, Stephanie. Um, and uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, it's really a great pleasure to introduce Dan Lillenquist uh, to you all. He's a Senior Vice President and Chief Strategy Officer for Intermountain Healthcare. Uh, really uh, spent uh, an amazing career at Intermountain over the last 10 years, uh, working with them on their strategy. Uh, but uh, before that, he was a uh, st state senator in the Utah State Senate, where he worked on Medicaid in Utah, uh, and previously a strategy consultant with Bain and Company. Uh, he's a, received his uh, JD degree from the University of Chicago Law School and a BA from the Brigham and Young, uh, Brigham Young University. Um, but the reason he's here today, uh, as, he'll, uh, as he'll talk about, is an effort he's led outside of Intermountain uh, called Civica RX, uh, a really innovative program to bring generic drug uh, products back to the US market. Uh, all of you are familiar with this issue because we get a weekly newsletter 
uh, from the Stanford Pharmacy about uh, drug shortages, uh, Dan's effort with Civica, and as I'll tell you, with hospitals around the country, are to actually make that thing, uh, that notice a thing of the past. So Dan, thanks so much for joining us. Uh, I'm really excited to hear about this, one of the most creative uh, actually healthcare innovations over the last several years. Uh, so Dan, thanks so much. Kevin, thank you, and it's good to be with you. It's, it's an honor to be here um, in the Stanford Grand Rounds, and it's nice to see you, my friend. Um, uh, a, a little anecdote for, for Kevin. Kevin was um, one of my earliest advisors on Civic RX, and I was reminiscing with a group right before the call that um, I remember exactly where I was when I first spoke to him, and I remember what I said to him. I had read his writings on drug shortages, and I think um, my first comment was, Kevin, I've read what you wrote, and I think you're wrong. And um, to his credit, he, uh, he said, well, let's talk it through. And it turns out um, we made each other better, and I'm excited to tell you what we're doing with Civica. So I'll pull up my slides real, real quickly. Let's see. Share my screen. All right. Let me see if this, this works. All right. Well, terrific. I'm really excited to tell you a little bit about Civica, a little bit about the history of Civica, um, where we are and where we hope to go. Um, but this really starts um, back in uh, 2016. Uh, after Kevin mentioned I had served in, in the Utah State Senate, I actually ran for the U United States Senate in 2012 against Senator Orrin Hatch absolutely destroyed me in that race. And um, after, after losing that race, I didn't know what I wanted to do with my life. And one of my former Bain uh, consulting colleagues uh, said, hey, you really should consider come work with Intermountain Healthcare and you, you'd like them. And, and so I, uh, I found my way into, into Intermountain Healthcare really on our population health side of the business. But I began at the time writing um, a weekly column for our, our local newspaper, the Deseret News, and I'm an economist at heart. And, you know, so in early 2016, when Martin Shkreli, you remember Pharma Bro and, and Dara Prim hit the news, um, it really bothered me that in a free market, uh, that, that, that such extortionate prices could be charged for a drug that had been on the market for 50 years. And about six months later, when Heather Bresch, Mylan, and EpiPen, that story hit the market about epinephrine, a, a drug that's been on the market for 100 years, is clearly past its patented life, uh, was being um, exploited at the expense of people. I, I, I thought, you know, why, why is this happening? I'm a free market guy. I believe that markets work, but there was something happening in the generic drug market that, um, that wasn't working. And... And so I thought about it, I uh, read about it. I was at the gym uh, work, working out on a treadmill in August of 2016 when, um, when it kind of all clicked in my mind. And, and, and really what you're seeing in generic drug shortages, it's essentially the equivalent to uh, the situation you would have with a, with a uh, traditional natural monopoly. So there's three factors that are actually causing disruption in the generic drug market. First is inelastic demand for a product, right? When you need insulin, for example, there are no close substitutes. The same with epinephrine, the same with, with Daraprim, if you've got toxoplasmosis, those are the, the expected treatments. So when demand is perfectly vertical or inelastic, um, the second factor, I mean, essentially people will pay whatever it takes to get the drug. The second factor really is that um, if, uh, if you think about manufacturing drugs, there are huge economies of scale involved. Um, it'll take you years and millions of dollars to actually set up a production line, but your first dose of a product costs pennies to make. And so you amortize your fixed costs over volume. And so essentially the second factor are huge economies of scale. But the third factor, and it's a factor that everybody overlooks, that in many instances um, in these markets, one or two manufacturers can meet the entire market demand. So if you have five manufacturers competing for a market, what that leads to is price instability, a collapse in the market price, a shakeout of that market, and then an equilibrium, at least on the manufacturing side, where one or two people are left. Now, if you have one manufacturer in the market and um, they have inelastic demand and they control the market. They can essentially dictate the price 
to the market, which is exactly what happened with EpiPen and with Theraprim. So uh, as I thought about it, I thought, you know, the closest yeah. analog to this business really is a public utility. If you think about a power company, um, the same factors are in place. You have inelastic demand, meaning everybody needs power and they're willing to pay for it. Huge economies of scale, and you only need one manufacturer. I guarantee you in your communities, you only really have one, um, uh, one power company, and we regulate those power companies through a public service commission. Well, I just run for the US Senate. I, um, I didn't have much hope that, that Washington would intervene. Even if they could though, it's an extremely complex market to try to regulate. So the idea of Civica came about to say, look, what if we organize the demand side of the equation and created a totally new market for generic drugs? And so I'm gonna click through my slides and, and talk a little bit about that story. I got off that treadmill, um, started researching a little bit more. That's when I called Kevin early on and, and brought together some advisors. We actually met in, in Salt Lake City in September of 2017. And Kevin was one of 20 folks there with us as we talked about this idea. But we launched Civica in September of 2018 as a, no, a novel nonprofit company. And since that time, um, we've, we've um, been able to so far extend the mission of Civica to cover um, a substantial portion of the market and address a lot of these issues. So today we have over 50 health systems involved with, with Civica, including um, the, many of the names, all these names on the list. We have a few others that have joined, um, but um, it's governed, Civica is governed by health systems and philanthropies. It's, um, our original plan was to have 20 years on the market, or 20 drugs on the market in five years. Um, we are just over three years into, um, into our project here and we have 50 um, drugs on the market to date. In fact, I have with me right here, and I don't know if you can see this, the, the first dose of Civic product ever delivered to a patient was, um, was a one gram vial of vancomycin, which was administered to a patient at Riverton Hospital uh, Intermountains Riverton Hospital in Utah on September 26th of 2019. And um, uh, it was a great day, but just, just over a year after we had launched the company. You know, what's been interesting about this, um, Civica has been written about um, extensively and um, what people are starting to realize, and we're, we, we came across this idea, developed it and launched it, that there is a need for um, these types of innovations in healthcare. Essentially what Civica is, is it's a healthcare utility model. Um, Intermountain Healthcare was not large enough to address these problems on its own and neither was HCA or Mayo Clinic or Providence or Trinity or some of the other systems that joined us early on. But we realized that this was a collective action problem. And by organizing Civica in a um, nonprofit structure, a non-stock nonprofit company, with very clear rules about um, how people interact with Civica, that we were able to create the collective action needed to solve um, these issues. And I recommend to all of you the, the recent New England Journal of Medicine Catalyst article written by Carter Dredge, uh, who was one of my early collaborators with Civica about um, this idea of healthcare utilities, because I think Civica is the first application, but the applications from here um, uh, you know, we're just beginning to explore. We think there are a lot of opportunities to, to take a similar construct to fix broader um, healthcare related structural issues. So here's where Civic is today. We've produced over 50 million vials of medications and, and, um, and have delivered them to, to over 21 million patients. We have 50 health systems involved, over 1400 hospitals, which equates to one third of the licensed bed in the United States. And um, one of the, and I'll speak about our model a bit, um, uh, you know, in, in a few slides, how our model works, but, but it's held up extremely well under COVID. Um, we're also supplying the US Department of Veterans Affairs and the Department of Defense. Um, our expected run rate revenue is $100 million this year. We're profitable as a standalone entity, um, self-sustaining. 
Um, and we expect to produce 38 million uh, vials, doses, containers of medication this year with an average price of $2.58 per vial. Here's um, really when we set out to create Civica, we, we really had three goals in mind. One was to bring true competition to the generic drug market, focusing on value, really both price and the quality of the medications. The second was to ensure stable and predictable supply of essential generic drugs, correcting shortages. And, and when we started this program, um, you know, when I went and sp spoke to the Intermountain Chief Pharmacy Officer, we were tracking about 200 shortages of essential medicines every day. And, and so as we've launched Civica, we, we were working, every medicine we produced was on that list of um, shortage medications. So um, we wanted to make sure that um, when our patients needed a medication, it was available and affordable. But the third goal really is to be the conscience of the market, serving as a check against aggressive pricing behavior. And, and this really gets to the regulatory aspect of what we're trying to do with Civica. Ordinarily, when you have natural monopolies, as I ex explained on the first, um, at the very start, we usually have a mechanism for government, um, uh, inter not interference, but regulation in the sense that um, with your power company, you have a public service commission that oversees the rates that the power companies can charge to the community. Uh, and the power companies also, or the public service, service commissions also have an interest in the stability and predictability of supply. When it comes to the generic drug market and the hundreds of potential drugs that we could make, Civica is focused on addressing market failures. We have no interest in making um, products where the market is functioning appropriately, but where there is a market failure that's evident, and, and you see this with both shortages and aggressive pricing behavior, the role of Civica is to intervene in those markets to create stability and competition in, in an appropriate way. So here's just some examples um, of medicines that, that Civic is producing today. Um, these will all be familiar to you as clinicians, but these are really the foundational drugs of, of, of modern healthcare. And, um, and we're, we're proud of, of our success so far. There, we started all with sterile injectables. I'll speak a little bit about what we're doing uh, to address market failures in the retail channels in just a minute. But um, th this is where we've started well, we have uh, about a, another hundred or so drugs that we're targeting that we hope to bring into this model and create both stability and fairness in pricing. Um, Civica, what we, what we did not realize, and one of the, realize, one of the um, actually pleasant um, uh, you know, surprises to us as we launched this model, we thought that we were gonna have to physically manufacture each drug but, but the real innovation was the business model. And um, what we found was there were willing partners who were, who were ready to come forward and, and work with us to stabilize the market. Um, we could deliver a third of the US hospital market with committed contracts. And as a result, we've had just tremendous positive response from, from existing high quality manufacturers to work with Civica. And that's allowed us to move as quickly as we've moved. So here's um, a simplified version of the supply chain. The typical hospital supply chain is extremely um, complex, not as complex as the retail space, um, but, but our innovation here was really simple. Let's organize the demand side of the equation, capitalize the company with hospitals and philanthropies. And that we will do is create um, contracts with those hospitals, what we call a minimum viable volume contract where the hospitals commit to buy a minimum of 50% of their volume for a particular drug from Civica. And then what Civica does is we manufacture to those contracts, working you know, with contract manufacturers to deliver the product. But we also hold Civica product in one warehouse and we hold between four and six months of safety stock for every drug we carry for our entire membership group. What we've realized, um, one of the challenges with shortages is that all of us, um, when health systems experienced a shortage of essential medicines, it would trigger um, irrational buying behavior when you look at it collectively, very rational buying behavior for, for systems like Intermountain Healthcare. 
So if you know vancomycin is going to be on shortage or there's an issue with vancomycin production or heparin or whatever it is, what the traditional response has been from the large health systems, is they will go buy a bunch, as much as they can and store it. And what it would do is essentially clear off the shelves of the wholesalers and, and distributors who would then have to push their product into what's called um, restriction or essentially they would restrict, um, they, uh, they would restrict their distribution to certain set allocations and that would create um, shortages across the board. And, and what we realized is that, that the manufacturers couldn't really effectively respond to demand signals because these drugs would go from boom and bust to oversupply to undersupply and back and forth, often because they couldn't see what Intermountain Healthcare and HCA and Providence and Mayo Clinic had on the shelves. And what we would do, it was like a game of hungry hippos. The moment there was a shortage, we would try to get as many as much of the uh, material as we could, as the drug we could, we would store it to, to protect ourselves. And again, it's just like showing up at the grocery store every morning and, and see them, the, 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 the milk um, is all gone out of, off the shelves um, in the refrigerator. That's what was happening with the generic drugs. And what we said to the market now with Civica was, you don't need to worry about that um, because we are keeping enough safety stock for the entire membership group for, for months. And um, this was particularly helpful for us when COVID hit because when, when we started to see a 300%, in some cases, 300% demand increase for drugs like, um, like fentanyl, um, uh, you know, we were able to, we had enough supply on hand to, um, to get that drug to folks like NYU Langone who are in the middle of, of the early stages of that pandemic. And, and while at the same time still being able to, to meet the needs of our customers throughout the country. And so um, that, that's how the model difference, differs. Um, again, the important part of the model is that we contract on a multi-year basis with hospitals on a take or pay arrangement on a cost plus model that allows us to hold safety stock for the inventory or for the industry. And that has taken um, many of these drugs out of a shortage situation, made them available and made them stable. One of the uh, also really fun things for us is um, th th this idea has been really well received politically. And um, we, we found, you know, you're doing something right when both Elizabeth Warren and Senator Mike Lee from Utah love what you're doing. And um, what we worked with very closely with, with on a bipartisan basis and with the Trump administration um, to start repatriating manufacturing back um, to the United States. And so Civica, this is um, a recent picture of the Civica facility we're being, building in uh, Petersburg, Virginia. Um, it is a 120,000 square foot um, manufacturing facility that will allow Civica to manufacture 90 million vials and 50 million pre-filled syringes in this facility a year. It's in partnership with, with BARDA and the US government. And um, uh, we're, we're really excited to begin uh, repatriating drug manufacturing to the United States. What's not reflected in this slide is, is this facility is, is built next to a active pharmaceutical ingredient company called Flow Pharmaceuticals that will begin making active pharmaceutical ingredients for the products that we package and, and uh, in this facility um, just across the street. The, um, um, as you know, you may know today, 80% of the world's active pharmaceutical ingredients are made in China. And many of these drugs that, um, that a SIDVIPA could began, uh, began this process, uh, we decided early on that we would not source from China, that we would seek for alternative supplies of, of active pharmaceutical ingredients. And we're thrilled that the federal government is partnering with us to repatriate drug manufacturing. It's a, a matter of national security, in my opinion. And, um, and this will be the first of hopefully many projects to, to bring this manufacturing uh, back home. <clears throat> so um, with that, I mean, almost immediately after we launched Civica, in fact, it was three weeks after we launched Civica, I, I sat down in um, San Francisco with uh, Paul Markovich, the CEO of Blue Shield of California. And, um, and he immediately said, hey, let's start working on a model for Civica for the outpatient um, uh, pharmaceutical market. 
And uh, this is still early days. We launched the company earlier this year, but Civica Script, um, which is um, again, organized as a nonprofit company that nobody owns and nobody can monetize. We've partnered with 18 Blue Cross plans, Anthem and Kaiser and others on this project. We now have 140 million Americans covered by 22 large payers involved with what we're doing with Civica Script. Civica Script will give us the platform to take on drugs like insulin, like, um, uh, frankly, like EpiPen, um, to, to address these market failures in the broader market. And um, what we're excited about here is we're finding ready partners um, who um, on the retail pharmacy side who are ready for a new model. And the, the, um, the, the goal here with Civica Script is to bring relief to patients who, um, who particularly those with chronic diseases who um, require the medications um, to live. And, and so we're excited about where that's going. It's again, early days. We'll have some announcements in the coming months that I think will get everybody uh, pretty excited about what we're doing with Civica Script. You know, I think maybe the most important thing we did early on with Civica was just recognize that I'm a hospital guy um, and I barely have experience with hospitals. I'm more of a strategy guy. Um, that, that my job would be to make the market. And what we would find is excellent, experienced pharmaceutical executives to run, to run Civica. And um, one of our most important hires we made was Martin Van Trias, who is our CEO. This gives you an, ex uh, an example of the experience. We, we have, I think, close to 200 years of experience in, in, in manufacturing pharmaceuticals with this team. Um, Martin retired as the chief quality officer at Amgen and was routinely on the top five list of medicine makers, most influential people in all of pharma. And Martin um, came out of retirement and uh, is, has been running Civica for the last three years and has been doing it for a dollar of compensation a year. Uh, we can afford to pay him. Uh, but he, he wants to do this um, and has donated his time to build Civica. And he's built an incredible team of people to address these needs. And this just gave me an example of the quality of folks that we have working with Civica. We've also launched, uh, it took us two years to actually uh, work through the IRS and get uh, our tax exemption as a 501c4. And, but uh, since that time, um, partly because the IRS has never seen a model like this, um, we are an operating company that's brand new, that's organized as a Delaware non-stock nonprofit corporation and nobody actually owns Civica. It's governed by health systems and philanthropies and it's, um, the rules are very clear. Everybody can join, everybody gets the same deal. And so if you join today and I'd love to have Stanford University join this, uh, this, um, this um, initiative, but it's, uh, it's essentially everybody can join, everybody gets the same deal. People join today, they get the same deal as HCA and a Mountain Mayo um, uh, to the penny on every product. Um, so, but we've launched the Civica Foundation because we're finding there are certain drugs that, that philanthropy really has an interest in leaning in on and um, insulin is one of them. And uh, I, I can't speak much more to that, but we're, we're very encouraged with the philanthropic response to, to our aspirations to solve um, the affordability crisis with insulin and EpiPen and other things. So um, look for some news there in the coming months. And um, uh, again, it's one of those avenues that they, they know that nobody, the philanthropy's interest in joining with Civica is, is an understanding that, that nobody is going to uh, uh, get rich or, or extract excess profits with what Civica is trying to do, which is an advantage as we fundraise. So that um, is, is our presentation on Civica. Again, thank, thank you for your time. I, I'm happy to take questions, but really appreciate your interest in, in what we're trying to achieve with Civica. Dan, thanks so much for that, for that great presentation. I, you know, um, I wanna, as we've, uh, you know, in those discussions in 2016 and, and going forward, you know, our focus was a lot on price. You know, and over time, we've learned a lot more about the quality of medications, uh, of quality of generic medicine. So kind of how does Civica approach uh, the, the quality issue? Maybe we should 
tee it up a little bit more about what the challenge is and then what you're doing about it. Yeah, uh, Kevin, I mean, that is a major concern. In fact, um, one of the reasons why Martin Van Trias wanted to join our effort specifically was um, he, he lived through and saw the heparin crisis from 2009 when the Chinese company synth, uh, synthesized a protein in heparin and, and bolt up the product with, with, with adulterated um, protein that killed dozens of people in the United States and, and, and damaged uh, you know, hundreds of others. And the challenge we have with generic drugs is, is nobody really understands where the active pharmaceutical ingredients come from. And, um, and that supply chain is very opaque. And there's an expectation that the FDA um, is on top of it, and they're not. Um, by the way, it's extremely difficult to, job to do with a very complex international supply chain. So with respect to Civica, because these products are administered by Intermount Healthcare, by Mayo Clinic, by you know hundreds of, of hospitals around the country, that that we knew that quality had to come first, and uh, and so what we've done deliberately is we you're actually not um, required by the FDA to to disclose where you acquire your active pharmaceutical ingredient, and Civica believes that should change. We, we, we don't really think it's important to disclose where it comes from, but also which facility it's made in. And, um, and so that there's clarity and visibility into when there's an issue in a plant in China, you should be able to know whether or not it's in the product that you have on your shelf. And um, so our approach around quality, you know, Donna Golbinski is our chief quality officer. She was the senior vice president of global quality for Bristol Myers Squibb and has developed our program. But, we insist on understanding exactly where our API is sourced. We, don't, we do not source from China. And so we source from areas where, um, where we are confident that the regulatory environment is sufficient, but also where we, we, we understand and, and are personally testing each batch that comes into Civica. So we take it seriously. Um, uh, we know that, that one issue, a quality issue, of a Civica product could, could damage and maybe beyond repair what we're trying to build. So that, that comes um, top of mind for us. And, and so we're, we're pioneering some things on our labeling that nobody's done before that we think is, um, should be a requirement for every manufacturer of a generic drug. Yeah, thanks. You know, it, um, uh, this issue of quality, uh, that Times article that uh, you alluded to from the week in review last week and talked to this a little bit. There, there are some really scathing books out there right now about the quality issue. Uh, one of the things you said is actually people should know the FDA actually doesn't test these drugs. The FDA only only reviews manufacturers' documents in most cases about the quality of the drugs. They don't independently test. Uh, so that's a, a huge move forward on, on Civica's part. I want to. One of the things you alluded to in the beginning is, if we go back to March of last year, we had headlines in the United States um, about the pharmaceutical supply chain and drug shortages that were going to hit us. That uh, that we weren't going to be able to take care of those patients in the ICU at NYU because we wouldn't have the medications, since fentanyl, midazolam, and all vancomycin were all generic, uh, and they were all made offshore. So how did Civica? Um, help us actually get through this pandemic? And what did you do with the national stockpile? Yeah, so, so Kevin, I mean, the, 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 to us, it seems fortuitous that Civica was ready to go in the sense that, um, you know, we had months of safety stock for each drug already stored. And um, a typical wholesaler has, um, what, what they've done to actually turn profits is to have just-in-time inventory. Well, if you have a global slowdown and, and a global spike in demand for certain drugs, um, just-in-time inventory feels like um, a really poor strategy. And a lot of us experienced that firsthand with PPE shortages last year. It's huge spike in demand. We didn't have enough on hand. Um, we didn't. It's, so so what, what people are starting to reevaluate is whether or not just-in-time inventory is actually an appropriate strategy for, for healthcare. Um, Civica took the approach from day one that we, and in fact, we built it into our, into our models on how we were going to pay for this, um, 
given the fact that we don't have investor returns to 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 think about, we were we were really thinking about stability of supply. So we had plenty. Um, in fact, even you know, Intermountain during that time, we could go to our regular GPO contracts, get what we could from our allocation, but get a hundred percent of what we expected from Civica because um, because we had enough. Um, we had thought through how to create elasticity in, in, in our own supply chain. And that is very simply by, by storing enough medication. So that allowed um, uh, uh, NYU Langone and others to actually draw heavily on the broader um, uh, portfolio uh, you know, of stored drugs. And we did that deliberately, we allowed them to do it. I think our members came together and said, yeah, that's the right thing to do. Um, but we were also then able to ramp up our um, manufacturing with our with our manufacturing partners in backfill and because we weren't sourcing out of China we were able to you know vast majority of our active pharmaceutical ingredient manufacturers were able to ramp up and meet our supply so we were um, uh, that, that slowdown in China exposed a lot of other supply chains that didn't expose Civica's. Yeah no that um, yeah it's amazing the quality story led, led to that um, because uh, there were calls all through last summer that this is going to be a continuing ongoing crisis. And it's, uh, thank goodness, it's one we narrowly avoided. Um, you know, uh, some of the questions actually have to do with uh, active pharmaceutical ingredients and uh, where they're made. Um, and, you know, are they made anymore in the United States? Like uh, one of the conversations was, you know, we don't make penicillin anymore. Uh, and if foreign countries decided, you know, in, in the middle of a, a trade war not to ship penicillin, we'd be out of penicillin. So where are APIs made and, um, uh, and how does that impact the supply chain? Well, let me start with penicillin and cephalosporins. 100% of the world supply of penicillin is made in China, 100%. And, um, and essentially, the Chinese government for years, and if you want a good book that, that, that you should read, you should read China RX. They've made it a, a deliberate uh, strategy, subsidized businesses to, to create that industry and to dominate that industry. So again, you know, penicillin, 100% of it's made in, in China. You know, we've been working with the, the federal government um, and, and that's one of the areas that, that, that they're very concerned about. And, as you know, dur during our ramped up trade war with China, Kevin, you, you saw this, they threatened to use that. Well, how, you're not gonna get medicines for your own people and that's just unacceptable. And so, you, you know, it's going to require some investment to bring cephalosporin manufacturing, you know, penicillin manufacturing back to the United States. And those are not cheap investments. It's about a billion dollars to build um, the scale of plant we would need to meet our own needs and really probably the needs of North America. But it's something that um, the pricing is so low from China right now, economically, it doesn't make sense for an independent company to do that. So this is one of those areas where uh, partnering with the federal government and through a mechanism like Civica, where you know, nothing will go to a shareholder, really just be held in trust for society at large, um, I think is attractive for our partners in the federal government. With respect to API manufacturing in general, um, we are just absolutely thrilled with the advancements that have been made at Virginia Commonwealth University with funding from the Gates Foundation on continuous flow manufacturing for active pharmaceutical ingredients. And if you think about it, APIs are extremely dirty process and that's a very labor intensive. And so in the 70s, 80s and 90s, when that business started to move to China, it was really for labor related reasons. And, uh, but again, if you've been to an API facility, it's very heavy, you know, industrial manufacturing. Um, what we're doing in, in Petersburg, Virginia is through the Flow Corporation is they've licensed the technology for continuous flow manufacturing and it is much less labor intensive and the waste, it's, it's, it, it takes about 5% of the energy and has uh, only 10% of the waste compared to active, regular active pharmaceutical ingredient manufacturing. So it's very clean, it's promising technology, and we hope to be able to start repatriating API manufacturing back to the United States. Um, but we, we are sourcing from Europe and Australia. 
and and um, in in areas where there's very clear regulatory oversight today for active pharmaceutical ingredients, but hopefully we'll be able to repatriate some of that back to the United States using some new manufacturing technologies. And then we've got a couple of questions kind of a, going back to the economics, like how did we get into this problem in the first place? Um, you know, so, you know, before, before Civica, you know, Stanford Hospital would have a contract for, you know, with, with a distributor, say McKesson, um, and then we look for the best price every quarter and they choose manufacturers on the basis of that. Um, and so what, what did Civica change about that kind of spot pricing model? Well, I mean, Kevin, that's the problem, right? That's the, that's the challenge. So, so what we did, when we did the analysis at the very start of, of putting together Civica, we found that there were, usually when a drug came off patent, you'd have five or six entrants and then competition would bring down the price. But the problem is for certain drugs, if you have five or six manufacturers, but you can meet the entire market supply off of one production line, then you have five times the capacity that you actually need to meet the needs of the market. So on a rational basis, Sanford wouldn't build five times the amount of hospital beds it needs to care for its patients. That'd be a misuse of resources. But if there were five times the capacity to see patients in your market, what would happen to the prices of, of hospital prices? They would they'd collapse. And that's exactly what happened. If you have a fixed cost that's very, very high at the start, but your marginal cost of production is pennies, the only way to actually pay off for fixed costs is over volume. And so what you would have is you'd have a race to the bottom on price. And so purchasers you know, who bought drugs actually exacerbated the problem as well as GPOs. Because what a GPO would do is to say, my job is to get the lowest possible price. And they would use, they would take the different manufacturers and they'd bid against each other, get a low price. But eventually other manufacturers said, it's just not worth doing anymore. And they left. Some of the products with Civica, we actually had to raise the market price to get manufacturers to come back in. We had, we had a, a product that was selling for 68 cents a vial. And the cost of the vial and the stopper and the medicine was 72 cents. So they were pricing actually below their marginal cost to try to, to, try to win. And what that's done is it, it created destructive competition, created instability in suppliers, people left, and then one or two suppliers dominated the market. But once they dominate the market, it's really hard to re-enter. Because what, what a monopolist does is it raises the price, extracts as much profit as it can, but a new entrant comes in, what they do is they collapse the price, try to wipe out the new entrant and then just raise it later. And you see that over and over and over again. So when you start with five or, you know, five or six competitors and it collapses to one or two, it rarely resets to four or five again, it just doesn't. And so what Civic is trying to do is to say, Look, our model works by, we are trying to find a sustainable price so that there can be two manufacturers in each market. And what Civica does is we organize our members and say, okay, let's take all of this purchasing commitment for a period of five years and, and take half of their volume. We don't want hundred percent of it. We don't wanna be the only supplier, but if we take half of their volume contracted on what's called a take or pay arrangement, we could bring very competitive, stable prices. And then what we've seen, Kevin, and this is what we hope we would see, is that if you've got a long-term stable price, it makes no sense for the other competitor to try to collapse the price of your contracts or good because then leave money on the table. What we're trying to set is an equilibrium price that's fair. Um, and what we think a manufacturer should make is between 15 and 30% margins on these products, not 3,000%, but they shouldn't be expected to subsidize the hospitals either. So in creating that new contracting structure, that allowed us to create what we felt like is a fair and sustainable market price, set that as a civic market price, publish that price. And what we're seeing is we're seeing, you know, other manufacturers kind of stabilize around the pricing that Civic has in the market. And that's exactly what we hope we would do. 
because we don't want people to leave the market. What we want is a fair and sustainable price. And um, so that's what we're, we're that, that's how our model works. So just kind of to recap, so we were paying our pharmacy people, you know, rewarding them for their performance for getting the lowest price drugs. They were rewarding the performance of our distributors for getting them the lowest price drugs. And all of that was causing us to have these drug shortages in the end. Uh, and so by just realigning the incentives in that supply chain, we've, we've you know, at least addressed some of these shortage issues, which is, uh, uh, and then Civica ends up being actually an, you know, an insurance function in the market, like to, to, to ensure that we have a, adequate supply. Uh, Dan, we got a couple of questions about um, uh, the retail market. I know it's not really what you've done yet or gone into, uh, but um, you know, so how would people get access to good, you know, Civica manufactured drugs? And uh, I know the retail market's much bigger challenge than what you're facing with the hospitals. So Kevin, we're actually really excited about it. And I can't announce these partnerships yet, but um, what we're finding is the appetite for Civica broadly for the model, which is a cost plus transparent pricing model um, is being extremely well received by payers and large employers. And frankly, retail pharmacies who actually have more of a platform play than they do, you know, they're solely a pharmacy. So if you think about a traditional business, if you, if you have a business and think of a pharmacy as the same way, you wanna buy as low as you can and sell as high as you can and make margin between, right? And that for a long time, pharmacies along with their PBMs and others have played into this spiraling up of costs, of prices on drugs. And then a lot of that's shared. Um, so what we've done is to say, look, um, Civica is a fully transparent cost plus business model. We will not pay rebates on products. And Kevin, you know that from the very beginning, we said we were not gonna do that. You helped us formulate that. But the idea is if Civica makes a product, everybody should know exactly how much it costs us to make it and what we think a fair market price is. Now with hospitals, that's easy. We publish our price, they pay us the price. With retailers, there's, there's a wholesale price. And then you also have to actually make an accommodation for a retail pharmacy to supply the pharmacists, et cetera, to have a reasonable dispensing fee. So the way Civica is going to approach it on the outpatient side is one, we're building terrific relationships with retail pharmacies that are part of a platform play. Think Amazon, Walmart, Costco. Others here are saying, look, we have this portfolio of things of value that we bring to our members of which pharmacy is a component. We've had tremendous um, response from those guys. But what Civica is committing to do and, and requiring them to do is that when we bring a Civica product, think if we end up bringing insulin to the market, Civica is actually going to print on the bottle a manufactured suggested retail price. What we think a fair retail price would be. And what we think is a reasonable dispensing fee for you know, a vial of insulin or an EpiPen is probably between eight and $10 for dispensing that at a pharmacy. And so as we're thinking through it, we're essentially organizing the payers, getting them to make purchase commitments, working with retailers. And when we think about payers, it really is around benefit design. And the idea is to put you know, things like insulin on the market for a, for a very clear sustainable cash price which is the same as the insurance price or the contract price with insurers. And so um, more complexity there, but the principles are the same. We won't pay rebates. Um, we're trying to, the benefit we're after is not to benefit shareholders, but it's a societal benefit. Now, Kevin, I have, I have three type one diabetic brothers. Um, two of them were adopted out of foster care. My dad's an endocrinologist. Um, one of my brothers has since passed. Um, but my other two brothers struggle, and, and then again, I had a, you know, one of my um, natural born siblings developed type one diabetes as well. And, um, and I think that, um, you know, if you look at the pricing, it takes, it costs less than $10 a vial to make um, Humalog or Novalog. And the market price shouldn't be $280 a vial. 
And so, you know, I'm not making an announcement here about, about insulin, but um, there are clear opportunities for us to kind of reset the market prices in a transparent way. And that's what exactly what Civica Script is focused on. Yeah, you know, we've been we've been looking a lot at the the retail pharmacy markets. That's not today's grand round talk. And on these markups, the markups uh, from the manufacturer, the markups at the retail level, and the actual prices consumer pay consumers have to pay. Um, you know, I think what you're talking about is a dramatic shift in the market. So it, at some level, it's really kind of interesting as Stanford as an employer is offering benefits, you know, that actually force us at the, at the retail level to pay the $280 for insulin that you talked about. Um, you're suggesting that for certain generic drugs, it'd be better for us to pay cash rather than through Stanford because it's actually going to be less than our copay. Now, Kevin, as we've looked at the market, there are 10 drugs that are driving 80% of the rebate model with PBMs and, um, and with payers, et cetera. 10 drugs. First one is Humira. Drugs number two and three, fast-acting, long-acting insulin. And so what's happening with the rebate structure is essentially a cost shift to your sickest employees with rebate payments back to payers and employers to do that cost shifting. What Civica is doing with Civica Script is we're looking at the best post rebate price that payers received. Think Stanford Health Plan um, for your own employees. And then modeling what Civica can deliver as a differential on that price. And that's why we have 140 million people covered by payers involved in the sense that when you do commit to a cost plus model, there's so much saving that comes to the payer post rebate after they get everything netted out that they're saying, yeah, we want to move to this new model. And that's um, what we hope to do. We hope that brings rational pricing to people like my brothers who are um, struggling to afford their medications every day. Yes. Yeah, so, um, you know, so we looked at, uh, you know, Lilly as a manufacturer of insulin paid out rebates and chargebacks of 122% of their net revenue. So the price you pay at the pharmacy is basically inflated over 100% compared to actually what even Lilly even gets. Um, so uh, maybe Errol will bring us back one day to try and explain all this to, to the group. Um, so Dan, uh, we're kind of approaching the end of our hour. Uh, really an amazing story about uh, Civica taking, you know, more importantly, kind of taking action and taking collection collective action. Uh, people in running hospitals looked at this problem for years, every single one of them. Uh, and you're the one who organized a group of them to get together and say, well, I know I can't solve this even at Intermountain. Maybe we could work on this together. And, uh, and we've, you know, we're all benefiting from these tremendous changes in the marketplace. Should say Stanford's right now a free rider because we get access to a more stable pricing structure uh, because you did all this at Civica, even if we're not a member of Civica. Um, and I think I'm also really excited about the focus on quality. Um, I think we haven't paid a lot of attention uh, over the last 10, 15 years to the quality of the medications we write, you know, scripts. Um, you know, generic metformin, 40% of generic metformin was removed from the market last year because of carcinogens. 100% of the ranitidine was removed from the market because of carcinogens. Um, and I think that's a really important story for us to understand as well. When we write a script for our patients, we want the economic benefits of generics, but we also want the quality. So, so Dan, thanks so much uh, for joining us today uh, and uh, great uh, good luck and success in uh, the next chapter of Civica. Maybe you'll come back in a year and explain to us how you cleaned up the entire uh, oral medication market. Uh, Kevin, it's an honor to be with you. Thank you so much for the invitation. What a pleasure.